So why don't we say a prayer and then uh, we'll jump into today's message. Let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for spring. <laughs> uh, thank you for this beautiful day, for yesterday. We know cold is coming, but we also know there's warmth on the other side of that. Uh, Father, we thank you for the privilege and gift to be able to be here together today as a community. Um, that we live uh, in a country that I want to say is relatively safe, uh, safer than most, Father. Uh, that we get to have fellowship with you, uh, that we get to live in this beautiful city. Uh, I do want to pray, Father, for so much happening in our country and in our world. I know there is lots of crime, there's gender-based violence, there is social economical challenges, there are social challenges uh, <clears throat> that will take uh, years, if not decades or more, to resolve. I pray that you will uh, put the right people in the right places to navigate those things and that you will always guide us as a church, collectively and individually, uh, to figure out how we can make a difference and how we can help <clears throat> making our city, uh, our country, and your world better. Father, we pray for conflicts around the world, uh, wars that continue, that become almost normal to us, uh, Ukraine and Russia, Palestine, Israel, it's just part of the daily news. Father, we pray for uh, those countries, for their leaders, we pray for peace, we pray for families that uh, have lost loved ones, that are living in fear and terror, uh, that somehow they will find your peace. Uh, for in the same breath, that will give us appreciation for the good and the peace that we have. Uh, for as we continue uh, studying the story of the Bible, uh, the scriptures, the grand narrative of what you have done from ancient times till today. Give us wisdom, give us insight, give us clarity. Help us to have crisp and clear minds. To take it all in. I pray in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> yes, believe it or not, <clears throat> we're back. Okay, in some sense, uh, we are racing to the finish line here as it has only taken us a couple of years <clears throat> to move from here uh, to there, but we are racing to the finish line. I really hope to be able to close this chapter uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but as always, uh, we have some questions to ask. Um, in Mark 1.15, uh, Jesus said, the time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Now let's see if how well your memory is serving you. As we spoke about this, obviously, about six, seven weeks ago. So please speak to your neighbor, not your spouse, someone that's not your spouse, to answer this question, what is the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven? Those phrases are used interchangeably in the text in Matthew and Mark. What do you think? There's no right or wrong answer. Just what do you think? What is the kingdom of God? If you get this wrong, you can obviously not be a part of it. <coughs> <coughs> okay. <coughs> so the stakes are high, people. The stakes are high. <coughs> okay. So speak to someone, not your spouse. What is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? You've got two minutes to figure that one out. Okay, is the puzzle resolved? Can, can we call it a day and say we know all truth? <clears throat> okay, so now, 
Next question. Next question. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Hmm. <laughs> Let me ask this. Who of us feels like we are believers in Jesus? Okay, majority of us. Some of us are working about it. Some of us don't know what the question was. So, fair question would be, what does it mean to believe in Jesus or to have faith in Jesus? We need to have faith in Jesus to be saved. We need to believe in Jesus to be saved. I say saved in inverted commas because that's a loaded word in itself. But let's just start with the basics. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Again, two minutes, two minutes with the neighbor. Okay, have we got that one done and dusted? We know what the kingdom of God is, we know what the kingdom of heaven is, and we definitely know what it means to believe in Jesus. Which then brings us to our third question for the day. Now, if you were wondering, I am trying to mess with your mind. <clears throat> what does it mean to be faithful to Jesus. So there is, I believe in Jesus. What is it that I believe in? And now the question is, what does it mean to be faithful to Jesus? So I'm saying, listen here, as a follower of Jesus, I am faithful to Jesus. What do I mean by that? Again, speak to your neighbor. <clears throat> Okay, so do you feel, f uh, do you feel filled now? The conflict in your heart has been resolved. Uh, you're good to go home. <clears throat> so we are obviously, these are questions that we are trying to answer and resolve or ponder upon. And there is not necessarily a correct answer. There might be multiple answers. Obviously, the challenge comes when we think that the one and only answer that we have is the right answer. And we've looked at that historically, that there's absolute truth 
but none of us can say, I know absolute truth. But yet, the answers to it might be different than what you think. So we have been looking at the grand narrative of Scripture. I hope you guys can see this. We are, this is, we are over here. That's us. <clears throat> and that's me, that's Lisa. <laughs> <clears throat> now, meaning us, uh, the church. Now, uh, on scale, this is not quite accurate because uh, this gap over here between trees and us is 2,000 years. I mean, this gap over here is maybe 1,000 years. So it's not, it's not quite accurate in scale. Uh, we are working on buying a bigger TV. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that we, can, that we can fit it all in. But what you have to remember today is that your and mine, our perception of who Jesus is, what it means to believe in him, and what it means to be faithful to him, is shaped mostly by these 2,000 years. And that we, for instance, you might or might not know this, we as a church, the Cape Town Church of Christ, that's part of the International Churches of Christ, uh, we find our origins and what we call the traditional Church of Christ, the mainline Church of Christ, they just call themselves the Church of Christ, they find their origins in what's known, uh, in the 1800s, was known as uh, some friends that worked together called the Stone Campbell Movement, from which the Churches of Christ, the Christian churches and the Disciples of Christ came. The Stone Campbell Movement found their origins in the Presbyterian Church. <clears throat> uh, the Presbyterian Church found their origins <clears throat> alongside with Calvinism, uh, two groups breaking away from the same guy, from John Calvin. John Calvin finds his origins in the Reformation movement that started by Martin Luther. Martin Luther finds his origins in Catholicism, the Catholic Church that was one of two churches for a period of 500 years, them in the Greek Orthodox. And so all of that, all of that history <clears throat> takes place over a year, and all of us are trying to make sense of who Jesus is, what it is that he had done, why he had come, what it means to believe in him and faithful to him based on this. And that is normal uh, and not necessarily wrong, but it is incomplete. Because if you think about Jesus being over here, we need to try and figure out with Jesus being over here, this is us to him, but then before him, there was this whole history, which makes up 75% of the scriptures that we read and call the Bible. And obviously the question that we need to figure out is not only what does everyone in this gap think, but what did these people, when Jesus arrived on the scene and he said the time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. If you lived here, AD 30, what did you hear? Because there's something, we, we hear something here. But that is based on what people here have been trying to make sense of Jesus. The question is, <clears throat> these people that lived up to the time of Jesus, what shaped their thinking, and what did they hear when Jesus said, I've come to bring you good news? So this is where we've been spending a lot of our time as we are trying to make sense of who Jesus is. So a quick recap. I should actually invite someone to come up and just do it. <laughs> okay, this will be very quick. So Act 1, Genesis 1, 2, creation and human calling. Act 2, a rebellion and the fallout. Uh, Adam and Eve rebel against God's purposes for their life, and there's a fallout of destruction and decay. Uh, God sets things back in motion through Israel and the Great Commission, Genesis 4, to Malachi, if you may. So our story begins in Genesis with Adam and Eve. They are set as God's image, his icon, his reflection in a garden, uh, the Garden of Eden. Uh, and they are given there, there's a tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and there is God's presence. 
but they disobey God, and because of their disobedience, they are ejected out of the land. Okay? Then we get a new couple, Abraham and Sarah, Abraham and Sarai, that the names changed later on. And we see this story, because remember, we are now, if you remember our previous screen, Jesus over here. What are the people hearing? And the people of Israel, with their forefathers being Abraham and Sarah, relived the garden story. They too, Abraham and Sarah and the people of Israel, were created and given the charge, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. Be my image in the garden, which is the land of Israel. And they too were given the tree of life in terms of the Torah. The scriptures is how God wanted them to live. They too had God's presence live with them and the temple, but they too were not faithful to God's calling of being image bearers, and they too were ultimately ejected from the land. So this is <clears throat> their history. Now, from the point of them going into exile, being kicked out of their own land, to the time of Jesus is 500 years. That's a lot of years. It's a lot of time where a lot of things happen. That's longer than when Jan van Riebe came with the Buiki, okay? It's a long time. So we are not trying to figure out again. 500 years have passed. What are these people thinking? <clears throat> they had, in this time, as we looked at a number of weeks ago, they had, if you may, six aspirations, six things at the time that they as a people were hoping for in nuanced ways. Like today, it wasn't one unified people. There were different Jewish sects believing different things. But the overall feel was this. They had the, they had the hope and the aspiration that God, Yahweh, would return as king to his temple. Of course, if you remember, in Ezekiel 10 and 11, Ezekiel had a vision of Yahweh's presence being in the temple, but departing from the temple. He lived amongst his people, but when he continually uh, warned his people to be faithful to him as image bearers, and they wouldn't listen, he said, if you're not going to listen, and I think God often does this to us, I will, um, if you may, hand you over to yourself. In other words, I'm not going to do something to you. I'm just allowing the natural consequences of the path that you're on to play out. And it did play out because in 586 BC, God's presence has left the temple and the worldwide dominating Babylonian empire came into Jerusalem and they burned down the temple. They took the people in exile, at least the wealthy and the priests and the upper class, they took them with them to Babylon. Forty years later, the new king of Persia, Cyrus, allowed them to go back and rebuild their temple. <clears throat> but even though they rebuilt their temple, God's presence, what's known as his Shekinah glory, never returned to the temple. So what the people are now waiting for in the time of Jesus, and they have been waiting for, for 570 odd years, that's a long time, generation to generation, telling the story, Yahweh will return to his temple. So they're hoping for that. Aspiration number two was they believed in hope that God would return to his temple, yes, but also that he would defeat their enemies. Okay? They've lived under the oppression of successive empires, They've lived under the oppression of the Babylonians, Persians, Greek, Greeks, and currently in the time of Jesus, the Roman Empire. And they had this aspiration and this hope, God will return, he will vanquish the enemy. Aspiration number three was that, <clears throat> and how these things worked wasn't clear. No one had a clear-cut path, these things were intertwined. Aspiration number three was that God would bring about a new world. Basically, the Jews of Jesus' time divided time into two parts. And this is very important to know and understand when you read the New Testament. There was what they called Olam Hazeh, which was the present age. That was characterized by 
sin, suffering, and subjugation. Then there was what they called Olam Haba, the age to come, <clears throat> where, or the last days, where God would decisively act to transform the world, eradicate evil, restore Israel's fortunes, and bring about a new era of righteousness and blessing. It is important to know that because when you read the text and the Gospels, you'll often hear about in the last days. We obviously read those last days from, if you think back of our little story here, we read it from our point of view as the last days, the end of creation, when we all die and supposedly go to heaven. But that's not what the last days we're referring to. See what we're doing. We're retrojecting our ideas onto the Scripture. The last days for them would be when God would come and He would bring about Olam Haba. In Matthew uh, 24 even, when it talks about troubles and people see all kinds of visions. And I, I met with someone recently who they had visions and read Matthew 24 to mean that the last days are coming and it's coming through COVID and we all need to escape to little towns. I kid you not. We all need to escape to little towns because destruction is coming to the city. Matthew 24 is talking about these last days, the last days of that age. With this then, God will bring about a new world, and this new world would be a kingdom of justice and peace, where everyone would live at peace and where people, particularly them, would be treated with fairness. They also believed, aspiration number five, that at this time, God would resurrect the faithful of old. This was mostly and loosely based on Ezekiel 37, uh, Ezekiel had a vision of a valley of dry bones, and God said to him, speak to the dry bones, and they'll come to life. He then speaks to the dry bones, and behold it, they come to life. I love that text, bone by bone, until there was a vast army. Okay, So they had this aspiration, when God comes to decisively act in their presence, in their time, he will resurrect the faithful of old. And then lastly, aspiration number six, that he would rule and reign the world with Israel. In other words, they would be his, if you may, vice regents when he returns in this new world, this kingdom, uh, this kingdom of peace, this kingdom of justice, they will rule and reign basically the universe with them. Now, these six aspirations were often summed up in phrases. So <clears throat> to say all of this takes a while. <laughs> so people would simply encapsulate this with the phrase, the kingdom of God. So in other words, when they thought the aspiration was that God would return as king to his temple, God will vanquish the enemy, God will bring about a new world, a kingdom of justice and peace. He will resurrect the faithful of all, and we will reign, rule and reign with them. What they said is, the kingdom of God is coming. Or Matthew, the author of Matthew, he uh, seemed to have been more sensitive to the name of Yahweh and replaced it with heaven, God's rule and reign. The kingdom of heaven is coming. The day when God will return to his temple. The day that he will decisively deal with our enemies. The kingdom of God is coming. Where the faithful of old will be resurrected. A kingdom of peace and justice where we will rule, rule and reign with him. They also use this phrase, as I said before, Olam Haba, or the world to come. But then they also use this Greek phrase that can be very confusing when you read the text and can now turn it upside down for you. Zoe Ionios, which is translated in our Bibles as eternal life or could be translated as the life of the age to come. So when they said, listen here, we, we are looking forward to eternal life, they were not looking forward to being disembodied souls that would be in heaven. Where they would be in the clouds playing harps, singing songs with David, Moses, and others. No, they were looking forward, eternal life, Zoe Ionios, life of the age to come. The age where God would return to his temple. The age where he would decisively deal with our enemies. 
the age where he would bring about a new world, a kingdom of righteousness and peace, the age in which he would then, make sense, resurrect our brethren and sisters, the faithful of old, and we will then together as people of the promise rule and reign with them. So whenever you hear that language being used, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, olam haba, you won't see, zoe ionios, you'll see in eternal life, that's what we should be seeing. That's what the people that lived over here would have heard if you look at the storyline before. They were looking forward to a time when, if we were to sum it up, God would redeem and restore the world, allowing his justice, love, and peace to reign supreme. Amen. Eternal life, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the world to come. A time when God would redeem and restore the world, allowing his justice, his love, and his peace to reign supreme in every corner. Different groups, though, had different beliefs as to how this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven, this world to come would be brought about. We touched on that before. The Pharisees that we read a lot about in the Gospels, uh, they believed that this world to come, all about the age to come, would be set in motion by strict adherence to the Torah. That gives you a little bit more sympathy for them. Because we can be very judgmental on the Pharisees with their strict little laws that they were keeping. But they were thinking, man, if we keep all these little strict laws and if we make rules about rules about rules, what we will set into motion is the kingdom of God. God will return to his temple. The Essenes, uh, they were a uh, separation group. They believed that the world would come if they were to actually, listen to this, <clears throat> separate themselves from temple corruption. So they believed the temple at their time was so corrupt that God would never bring about his kingdom with that corruption. So they removed themselves and lived at Qumran in the desert. Believe me, it's desert like you've not seen. I've been there. There is nothing. There is not. There is no green. No, no, no green at all. It is sand. It is, it is it's desert. It's not even sand. It's rock. It, there's nothing. But they believed if they did that, then God would set into motion his kingdom. Then obviously we have our friends, the Zealots and the Sikari. Uh, they believed that the kingdom of God would come if they overthrow Roman rule. They were a people of violence. They felt like eye for an eye. Okay, the only way that this thing will come about is if we step in and we do something. And if we act as the people of God, God will act with us. So, lots happening. During this time, though, scribes, teachers of the law, and the Pharisees would study scripture in the temple, the synagogue, and at rabbinic schools to try and make sense of what is it that God is doing. In other words, we've been waiting 500 years. Are we missing something? And they would study the text. They would hold on to prophecies like that of Isaiah 9 and 40. Now, in reading, and I'm sure the young folk, and even me as an older folk, reading books like Isaiah could be complex, or is complex. Uh, but it's important to remember that prophets like Isaiah lived in, again in a time and a culture different to ours. Back then, people often used poetic or symbolic language to share an important message. Just like our generation uses memes, songs, or art today to express complex ideas. I don't know about you, but I, for the older folk, who of us uses emojis? Okay, if you're old, you use emojis. Because young people use stickers. Yeah. My kids have told me, oh, you, what's that? They said you have like three emojis that you always use. It's a wink, it's a smile, it's a, <laughs> it's a hug. Okay. <clears throat> now, in the same way as you guys express yourself through those stickers, now these days I'm stickering as well. I'm never getting myself on the phone. 
<laughs> on the phone there, trying to find the right sticker for the right thing. In the same way, these guys used language that doesn't necessarily make sense to us. It's poetic, it's symbolic. For instance, Isaiah 9, uh, the prophet of Isaiah says to the people of his time, long before Jesus, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Again, that doesn't necessarily resonate with me. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So they are living, the people, from Isaiah up to Jesus. They're living in a time of turmoil, of oppression. And Isaiah is saying to them, giving them a message of hope, of a future leader, a leader that will come, a king, some form of messianic figure. Messiah, the word Messiah, is not equal to the, the actual Son of God, as in Jesus. The word Messiah simply means anointed one. So David was a Messiah, because he was an anointed king sent by God. A prophet could be a Messiah if they was anointed and sent by God. So they're not quite sure what this figure looks like, but they are expecting some form of messianic figure. A leader that would be so powerful and loving, most likely a king, that he would be called, Isaiah says, Prince of Peace. Wonderful counselor, everlasting father, even mighty God. Can you imagine being there, you're oppressed by people for centuries? Wouldn't you too hold on to something like that? Yeah. Wouldn't we too be sitting and having discussion around the, the dinner table saying, we cannot wait for the Prince of Peace to come? We do something similar as we talk about the end times in Jesus. A wonderful counselor. He will be an everlasting father. He, this king would even be referred to as God Almighty, not as in the deified son of God, but as other kings would be godlike. For the people of Israel, this was a message of hope that one day God would send someone to make everything right. They looked around them, and this is not what they hoped for. They looked around them. This is not what they wanted to experience. What happened to Genesis 12? I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. In Isaiah chapter 40, <clears throat> this message of comfort continues. And this is most probably another Isaiah, or one of his disciples, side note, that wrote this. It's called Isaiah 3. There are three Isaiahs, Isaiah 1, 2, and Isaiah 3. little crumb to think about. This Isaiah, the new Isaiah, Isaiah 3. <clears throat> he says, brings a message of comfort. Years have now passed from the previous Isaiah. Comfort, comfort, my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sins have been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. Isaiah was telling, third Isaiah, was telling the people of his time that their time of suffering was almost over. And God was going to do something. He was going to forgive them as a people. He was going to restore them. When he says her sins have been paid for, he's talking about divine forgiveness. God would wipe the slate clean. They would be able to start over as a nation. Then he continues, again, a poetic language. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for Yahweh, make straight uh, in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough grounds shall become level, the rugged places plain, and the glory of Yahweh will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." What is he saying to the people of his time? Get ready. The king is coming. 
In ancient times, when kings traveled, people would clear the road for the king so that the king would have a soft journey. Remember, they didn't have rubber tires. Isaiah is using this image to say that God himself is coming back to lead his people and that they need to prepare for his arrival by removing any obstacle that might currently be in their lives and in their hearts. Make straight paths for him. He is saying that they need to hold on for God's presence and power would soon be visible to everyone. You're not doing whatever it is that you're doing in vain. You're not living faithfully to Yahweh in vain. The King is coming, and He will show the whole world who God really is, bringing about justice and peace. So, it is against this backdrop that we finally get to our little man Jesus over here, in what I call Act 4. We're finally there. The return of the king. It is against this backdrop that the gospel writer Matthew says in Matthew chapter 1 verse 1, he starts a story against all of this, the comfort, comfort, waiting, prince of peace, all of that. He says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This word genealogy, we've looked at before in Greek, is Genesis, okay? So he's saying, this is the Genesis. I'm about to tell you the story, the Genesis of Jesus, the Messiah, the King, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Just like how the book of Genesis talks about the beginning of the world, Matthew is now talking about a new beginning. The Genesis of something new, new creation. This new beginning is centered around Jesus the Messiah, who is the fulfillment of everything that they hoped for and longed for. In Matthew chapter 3, now this gets interesting, he now says, and it will make a little bit more sense. He says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, turn from your ways, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It continues. This is he, John, who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah that we just looked at. A voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. What is John saying? Change your ways. God's kingdom is at hand. The six aspirations that you guys are longing for is coming into play. For the king is coming. God is returning to his temple, and everything is about to change. Next in line, we have Matthew 4. Jesus steps onto the scene. What does he do? From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is he saying? God is about to return to his temple. He is about to vanquish your enemies. He is about to create a new world, a kingdom, in which his justice, his righteousness, his love and his peace will reign supreme. A kingdom in which he will resurrect the faithful of old, where they will rule and reign with God together. Repent. Get your act together. Why? So they can go to heaven? No. The king is coming. Olam Haba is coming. Eternal life is coming. He is about to do everything. And you're about to see everything come into play. A kingdom of justice and peace. Resurrection of the faithful of all. Rule and reign together. At first, the people around Jesus didn't fully understand, and you see that in the text. They would say, what kind of a man is this? His own disciples, the apostles, or what is this man up to? Okay, who is he really? But later, the early Christians realized that everything that they have hoped for, all their dreams and all their aspirations were coming true in the life, teachings, 
death and resurrection of Jesus. Remember <clears throat> Act 1, God sits Adam, Adam and Eve, Adam and, I can't remember what Eve is in Hebrew, Ava, I think, life. He sets them in the garden, and what is their purpose? They are to image him. They are to expand the garden. They are to reflect him into this garden. They are to make the garden bigger, the community bigger, and fill it with justice, peace, love, kindness. But, as we know, they rebelled against God's purposes. Why? They worshipped created things rather than the creator. They got entangled by the things that God actually gave them. They had a failure of trust, a failure of faithfulness, believing allegiance, and a failure of purpose, what we could call Project Eden. And instead, as we read early on in the text, instead of spreading God's love, justice, peace, and kindness into his good creation, they spread, if we're honest, narcissism, arrogance, self-love, violence, and deceit. So, that leaves us with why did Jesus come? Jesus came to fix what was broken and bring God's plan back onto track. What was broken and had to get back onto track? Project Eden. The expansion of his kingdom. In Colossians 1.15, Paul says it this way. He says, the Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn supreme over all creation. The Son, Jesus, is the image, the icon of the invisible God, supreme over all creation. The Son, Jesus, is the reflection, the icon of who God is. He did, the Son, Jesus, what Adam and Eve, Abram and Sarah, Jacob and Rachel, even famous people like Samson, Saul, David, and Solomon couldn't do. He was faithful to God's calling and started something new. A new creation where the world could be redeemed and restored and God's love, justice, and peace could reign supreme. In Matthew 28, he says, The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life life as a ransom for many. Give his life for what? When Jesus gave his life, he paid the price to make this new world possible here and now. A world where God's kingdom would come to earth just as it is in heaven. And this kingdom would be about God's love, justice, and peace ruling over everything. That's why now will make sense when the disciples, his disciples, asked him how to pray, he taught them to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus was teaching them that God's kingdom would come on earth as in heaven right here and now. And Jesus wasn't just talking about the kingdom. He was setting it into motion through everything that he did. We mostly celebrate Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, but we forget about his life and his teachings. Every prayer that Jesus said, every calling of a disciple, whether it was the 12 apostles or others, every interaction, whether it was the woman at the well, the woman who washed uh, his feet with the tears, whether it was the leper, the paralyzed, the feeding of the 5,000, or the thief on the cross. What was he doing? He was saying and showing, the king is coming, the king is here, the kingdom of heaven is breaking in. He was going to get the uh, Project Eden back on track by bringing in the rule and the reign from heaven to earth. And through the rule and reign of heaven, the blind could see. Through the rule and reign of heaven, the poor were provided food. Through the rule and the reign of heaven, leprosy could be cured. Through the rule and the reign of heaven, everything is turned upside down. He was going to redeem and restore the world. 
allowing his justice, his love, and his peace to reign supreme. So, how is all of this connected to our six aspirations? Well, for that, we'll have to wait till next week. Amen. God bless. Amen.